In 1994, excavations began at a newly discovered site, an ancient site in eastern Turkey called Kobekli Tepe. What was it? Was it a settlement? Was it a town? That's what people kind of assumed at first. But no, it turned out to show clear evidence of no continuous habitation. Instead, Gobekli Tepe was a religious site, a pilgrimage site, a sacred sacramental site built 12,000 years ago. This is 7,000 years before the pyramids of Giza in Egypt, 7,000 years before Stonehenge. This discovery turned everything we thought we knew about ancient people on its head. We had always kind of assumed that civilization came first and then organized public religion came second. But now Gobekli Tepe overturns that assumption. It seems that nomadic people, hunter-gatherer tribes, herding tribes perhaps, would meet perhaps annually at this site from all over the place and do ritual, sacred, religious observances. Now, that is a remarkable thing all on its own, but even more remarkable is that when we dig down into the artifacts at Gobekli Tepe, we find only three human figures. Most of the art is animal, but only three human figures, by far the most significant, is a woman in the act of birth. And that adds another log to the fire that is fueling the idea that in the primordial prehistoric world, it was the goddess who held sway, not the patriarchal male god that we are so used to in our contemporary culture. At the heart of civilization then, it turns out, is religion and mythology. It is out of religious, it is out of the religious and mythological impulse that civilization comes. And at the heart of the religious and mythological impulse is the great goddess. Turning to a, just a little bit later site um, that many of us have heard of and studied in other classes and read about is Chattel Hayek. And this was discovered also quite recently in the 1960s in southwest Turkey. Now, this was a thriving urban center around 7,000 BCE. So again, almost 10,000 years ago. And what we see at Chattel Hayek are numerous female figures, opulent, sitting on a throne with a couple of tigers by her side some kind of kingly, you know, queenly kind of image. At least that's what we associate. So power and, you know, uh, generative power, opulence, um, fertility, and also a kind of fierceness, you know, a kind of political power, the power to kill. I mean, when you've got a couple of large cat animals next to you, you know, preying on whatever, that's a fearsome, nurturing slash violent kind of image. And so we see so much of that at Chattel Hayek. And, and then you go back even further. Let's, let's drop all the way back to, you know, 30,000 years ago, around 28,000 BCE. We find throughout the human inhabited areas, a lot of human figures. And 90% of those human stone figures are female, are women. You've all seen pictures of, we used to call her Venus of Villendorf because it kind of had a nice alliteration. But now we call her Woman of Villendorf, named after where she was found. Again, kind of a knit cap, naked, large breasted. And that assumption can only be it. Again, were these just toys that kids play with? Do these figures have no significance at all? Well, I'm afraid all we can do is speculate. And it seems to be that it's a very reasonable speculation to imagine that these were goddess figures, that there was something sacred about feminine power that was being 
um, immortalized in these figures. So here we are in our study of gods and goddesses and archetypes confronting yet another powerful version of the supreme being archetype, this time in female form. Now, to speculate further, it isn't hard to imagine, is it, that for ancient people, the connection between the powers of the earth and the powers of women would be obvious. That, that like the earth, women give birth out of their bodies and then they nourish that life with their bodies. Isn't that what the planet does for us every day? it would escape no ancient person's attention that the lunar cycle and the menstrual cycle are identical 28-day cycles. Again and again and again, we see the parallelism between feminine power and the powers of the earth itself that keeps us alive. This suggests the widespread presence of matrifocal matrilineal or matriarchal cultures in these early hunter-gatherer tribes. We have such little evidence to go on except the artifacts that they left behind, except these archaeological digs. We all remember, of course, that writing was only invented, you know, yesterday, around 3000 BC. So we're going so much farther back beyond that. We've got no written records to work with. You know, imagine living in a matrilineal culture um, so that when a young man marries a young woman, he takes her family name. So when my wife married me, she wouldn't be Mrs. Boland. I would be Mr. You know, what her last name is. That's matrilineal, that the family line is passed down through the woman. So that is just one of the many elements that spring forth from this goddess-centered religion and mythology that seems to be the pillar in so much primordial, primeval human society. But then came the sublimation of matriarchy beneath the patriarchy, kind of got buried. And that to the point where today in the Abrahamic faiths, we live in a largely patriarchal society and system. And that's in fact true in all the religions, all the major existing religions in the world today, they're all patriarchal. The men are in charge. And we see that then echoed in our family institutions and our political institutions. I don't need to tell you that. So how did that happen? Um, how did it switch where God was a woman and then God became a man? As uh, one famous book about this subject puts it. It's a nice book called When God Was a Woman. Look into it. So... Why did that happen? There's some speculation we can do. Perhaps we see something shifting around the Iron Age, and I'm talking about 1200 to about 500 BCE. In that period when we invented furnaces and we could get iron to the, to the you know, we could smelt iron ore, we got the fires hot enough, and we began to make iron implements. Then we can make big plows that we could attached to a couple of oxen and pull them through a field. And so all of that upper body strength uh, shifted agriculture from what it had always been, a large, largely a concern of the women of the tribe while the men were out trying to pull down a woolly mammoth. The women in typical societal organization in these hunter-gatherer communities were the keepers of the seeds, the keepers of knowledge. They were the botanists. They were the doctors. They, had, they knew what all the medicinal properties of all the barks and funguses and leaves and roots were. And naturally, it's a safe assumption to say that women invented agriculture, systematic agriculture, the keeping of seeds, the planting in specific ways, and being in touch with the cycles of the seasons and, and the moon and the sun. And so we see with the coming of the Iron Age, agriculture shifting to the male. And, and perhaps that's when men assert more dominance and then their gods become men as well. We certainly see that when the hunter-gatherers become herdsmen. You know, when, when you are a hunting people, you are a killing people. You kill animals. And then you're like, why should we run around after these animals? Let's just capture a bunch of them, put them in a pen, put bits in their mouth. You know, we see in the fossil record when 
these oxen and other animals show wear in their teeth from having bits in their mouth, harnesses around them. So let's start domesticating animals. And then that process led to herding animals. The great cultures of the Aryans or the Persians and their horses, the Greeks, the Hebrews, these become patriarchal cultures. Because when you are a herdsman, as we were thinking about in our uh, the Mass of God video, when you become a herdsman, you're always moving the herd. And so you're always on somebody else's land. You're not attached to one place. You're often in conflict with other peoples. War becomes a common activity. And the virtues of the warrior, the virtues of violence, of aggression, of killing, become the virtues of your ethos and your culture. And then, of course, as we've seen, those get projected onto the god. Your god becomes a protector, warrior god. Where does the goddess go? Well, she doesn't, of course, just vanish into thin air. And in many of the systems we've been studying in our pantheons, we see the god and the goddess side by side. All of the male-female polarities of Gaia and Uranus, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The male-female pairs that come out of the primal chaos or primal one or unity. But in the Hebrew system, out of which we get the Bible, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, there, that God, the goddess disappears. He does not have a wife. Once you go to monotheism, and, and that God is prim, pri, primarily masculine. Now, one could easily argue that, as we did last time, that the one God of the biblical traditions absorbs into himself all of the qualities of all the goddesses and gods that they vanquished, that the Hebrews vanquished. So we see some of those qualities, the qualities of Demeter, you know, the earth goddess, the 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 abundance and the fertility of the soil. And so we certainly see vestiges of that. And when we get to the Christian tradition, oh boy, does the goddess come roaring back in the Virgin Mary figure. Now I know, technically, she's not a goddess in the Roman Catholic tradition or in any Christianity. But you know, when it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's kind of a duck. And if Martians came down from Mars and studied Roman Catholicism, they would say, fascinating polytheistic system with its one of its principal deities being the goddess Mary. <laughs> you know, I saw it on a bumper sticker just the other day in, in, in Spanish. With, without Mary, nothing. With Mary, everything. The centrality of Mary not only in Catholicism, but in the very origin story of the Mexican people, of the Virgin of Guadalupe, and the vision that led to the founding of the nation of Mexico as, as, as it is this beautiful, fascinating, conflicted marriage of indigenous American peoples um, overlaid by old world people with their old world religion, Christianity, that idea of the goddess at the center of it all is so key. And so what is the role of the goddess, finally, in all of the world's mythical systems? Well, she, of course, is the mother through which all is born. So to borrow again, just from our own, you know, local family structure, the father is the seed and the mother is the womb, just to strip it down to its absolutely biological basis. And so you see that, again, let me touch on Christianity for a moment, where the father is the disembodied spirit and, and, and he needed Mary, he needed a human womb to give birth to himself. So woman is the matrix through which all of us take form. We are all the goddess and the goddess is us. So the, in a sense, to be human then in many of these mythic systems is to be that meeting place of the male and female, of the spiritual and the material, of the eternal and the temporal, of the formless and the form. And so that's what makes 
all the stories that surround the great God is so potent. You know, she is, of course, the mother of the God child. Isis gives birth to Horus. Mary gives birth to Jesus. Of course, it is through woman that the God presence takes human form in the world. All the avatars of Vishnu come through a goddess, come through a woman. And in many of these stories, as we'll see, these are quote unquote virgin birth stories, or to put it more accurately, miraculous birth stories, non-biological events. You know, Horus is conceived um, by his mother Isis when she floats above the body of her dead husband, Osiris. Uh, Mary is impregnated, the gospels tell us, when the, the spirit of the Lord speaks into her ear. The Buddha um, gives birth to himself. He flies down from the celestial sphere and enters into his mother's body. So we don't need a biological dad in these stories, right? So what does that mean? Do you, again, read them literally? And I think we've dispensed with that pretty, pretty thoroughly. So when you read them symbolically, you realize, hmm, what is being said? That the God child, the Jesus, the Buddha, the Horus, etc., they are born from above. They come, their nature, yes, they're walking around in an animal body like the rest of us are, but their nature comes from a higher spiritual reality. And that's the that's the in-between that the goddess plays. She is divine and she is earthly. And so she is the doorway through which all comes into being. It's a remarkable supreme being archetype, quite distinct from the patriarchal God of the Hebrew Bible or the rest of the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. So finally, to touch back on our Garden of Eden story, this is what, this is another lens through which to view Eve. Because as we discussed when we were talking about the Adam and Eve story, is Eve a villain or is she a hero? And in traditional mainline Christian and Jewish traditions, Eve is weak and her weakness wrecked everything for everybody. So she's kind of a villain. But now we see that, of course, woman is the downfall of mankind, of humankind. Because in this sense, right, hold on, in this sense that all of us, you, me, every human being that's ever been born emerged from the body of a woman. In other words, it is woman who initiates us into the world of form. And the world of form is death defined. Death defined. Everything born is going to die. As the Hindus call it, so this is samsara. This is a world of, of confusion and ignorance and longing and unmet needs and injustice and suffering. I know you're familiar with what the world is really like. It's rough out here. So it is woman who brought us into this place where it's hard. And is that one of the reasons why she gets kind of vilified in some of these stories, certainly in the traditional read of the Garden of Eden or in the Greek myth of Pandora? Again, Pandora, who we'll read about later. In Greek, pan means all and Dora means gifts. Pandora means all gifts. And so we all know the story that when you open Pandora's box, all the bad stuff came out, you know, pestilence and disease. And I guess that's the same thing, war and violence and cruelty and selfishness and, and all the bad stuff, you know, boo, Pandora. But go back and slow down. Her name is all the gifts that what also came out of that box was faith, wisdom, love, knowledge, creativity, healing, beauty, that if you want any of it, you must take all of it. 
isn't that what the goddess teaches us? That to be born is to say yes to the whole mess. And it's magnificent and it's beautiful, but it really hurts this being alive. So as we think further into this wonderful supreme being archetype, the great goddess Mahadevi in Sanskrit, the great mother, we see again and again how this archetype of the great goddess plays out in all kinds of cultures, just as we saw in our study of the biblical God in the Masks of God video. Sometimes she's sweet, sometimes she's nice, sometimes she's gonna flood your whole world and kill you all like Ishtar. <laughs> so this doesn't stop multiplying and multiplying and multiplying into ever new and more dazzling facets. That's how mythology works. That's how religious studies works. The further into it you go, the less you know, but the more you understand. It's the paradox of immersion in everything that we've been working on. See you on the other side.